Welcome to the second public lecture today from Dr. Nathan King. It's a privilege to be able to hear from him. Before I begin tonight's lecture, I need to, my, need to express my thanks to the guest speakers committee of the Faculty Senate for their support of this presentation. We had originally hoped to do this in person, but we all know how plans change and change frequently during COVID times. Before I turn the floor over to Dr. King, I want to say a little bit about him and how I came to engage more fully with his work. He's professor of philosophy at Whitworth University in Spokane, Washington, earning his PhD in philosophy from the University of Notre Dame in 2009. Uh, I first met Nate in 2016 during a year-long grant project funded by Wake Forest University. His project during this time was to develop a book focused on intellectual virtues that would be suitable for use in undergraduate courses and for more general audience um, uh, contexts. He published this work in 2021. I'll drop a link to it in the chat in just a moment. The work, The Excellent Mind, Intellectual Virtues for Everyday Life, offers a helpful framework for thinking about the value of cultivating good intellectual habits, helpful advice for fostering intellectual virtues, and a close look at specific intellectual traits, such as curiosity, carefulness, autonomy, humility, self-confidence, honesty, perseverance, courage, open-mindedness, firmness, fair-mindedness, and charity. So I've assigned this book in my Reasoning and Critical Thinking course ever since it came out last summer, and I can tell you students respond very well to it. I've had numerous unsolicited comments in our course evaluations about how students read and benefited from this work and, uh, and how they, they're going to keep the book and continue to reread it after the class. So to me, that's a sign of success in terms of a, of a successful work. So tonight, Dr. King will be offering a lecture titled Educating for Intellectual Virtue. He'll present for approximately 30 minutes, and then we'll have time for Q&A. And depending on the size of, uh, of the audience, um, I may be leading all the, Q the questions this time, um, but I'm hoping to record this and make this available more generally for the campus. So without further introduction, I'll turn the presentation over now to Dr. King. Nathan, the floor is yours. Aaron, thanks so much for that really kind introduction and those encouraging words. I'm happy to be with you today and look forward to our time together. So what I thought I could do, so this talk is about educating for intellectual virtues. And I thought what I could do is sort of just talk through a handout. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and share my screen with you. And, and then we'll be, okay. Are you all able to see that okay? Yep. Okay, great. So, when we talk about educating for intellectual virtues, lots of different ways we could uh, arrange the material. One thing I thought we could do uh, just for today is to arrange questions about intellectual virtues into kind of the what, the why, and the how in terms of educating for them. So we'll start by talking about what these intellectual virtues are, then uh, a little bit on why educate for intellectual virtues and maybe how does educating for these virtues fit in with the educational aims that we already have, and then a little bit on how we might go about educating for them. Uh, I look forward to, to suggestions that some of you all may have about the, the how as we uh, move toward the end of our time together. So what are intellectual virtues? So here's just a sort of a first shot. We might think of intellectual virtues as the character traits of excellent thinkers. Um, that's, that's okay, that's not nothing, but it doesn't sort of give us a, a really rich account. So the next thing to do is to try to provide a little bit more detail. So here's an account that's, I think, fairly typical of what you would see in the kind of the philosophy literature on intellectual character virtues. So I'll just read it and then we'll go through, right, there are several components to this that we'll kind of unpack. So intellectual virtues are excellent character traits involving our actions, thoughts, and motivations in relation to truth, knowledge, and understanding. They often exist as means between extremes and are to an extent person sensitive or person relative. So start out with the, uh, the excellent bit. So intellectual virtues are excellent character traits. They're, they're not averages. They're not bad traits, obviously. They're, they're probably not traits that all of us have, right? They're traits that mark out intellectually excellent people, that is excellent excellent thinkers from sort of average thinkers, right? So to have a virtue, you've got to exhibit a kind of excellence. What kind of excellence? Well, uh, an excellence of character, right? So, so not just a skill, though intellectual virtues involve skills, 
but a trait of character where traits of character involve sort of at least three elements. First are our actions, our behaviors. Second, our thoughts. And third, our motivations. And then we've got to talk about the aim of those motivations. So there'll be intellectual aims, like aims for truth and knowledge and understanding. So to, to circle back to the actions, thoughts, and feelings and relate them to these intellectual goals, we might think of a, a person who has curiosity as someone who will engage in this behavior of asking a lot of questions or who will think that it's good to seek answers to those questions or who will believe that knowledge is worth seeking. This is also someone who will have certain motivations, right? They'll want knowledge. They'll also be averse to things like falsehood and ignorance. So we can see that, that these, these intellectual virtues as traits of character involve kind of complexes of internal states, right? Or dispositions to act and think and feel in certain ways, um, you know, in certain conditions in relation to truth, knowledge, and understanding. And so we could, there are other kinds of virtues, right? Moral virtues aim at moral ends like justice and the alleviation of suffering. Uh, intellectual virtues aim at intellectual ends, truth, knowledge, understanding, things like those. Um, there's a lot to be said about the relationship between intellectual and moral virtues, but I'll sort of leave that to the side for now. These intellectual virtues exist as means between extremes. So you can see we've got a, a chart here that illustrates this. We've got several intellectual virtues. You can see how each virtue sort of covers or is relevant to a, a sphere of activity. And then within each sphere, with, within each area of activity, we might have behavior, thought, and motivation that are deficient on the one hand or excessive on the other. So when it comes to managing our intellectual appetite, we have indifference as a vice of de deficiency, right? The person who, you know, when asked what's the difference between knowledge and ignorance says, I don't know and I don't care. I love that little, I got that from Tom Morris. I don't know and I don't care. That's somehow exactly right. Or right, there's on the other hand, the, the intellectual glutton who is constantly seeking knowledge about things that are maybe beyond them or that aren't their business or things like that, right? So curiosity, right, this mean in between amounts to appropriately managing our intellectual appetite. And several other intellectual virtues seem to be structured like that, right? So autonomy is a virtue that covers the realm of independent thinking, right? Like thinking for ourselves. On the one hand, you might imagine the, the vice, the deficiency of servility, sort of, you know, the person who, you know, needs to have their hand held through every assignment or just who, who asks, you know, what should I think without taking any intellectual initiative of their own. Uh, there's, on the other hand, the, the person who's isolated and, and sort of won't take intellectual advice from, from anyone, won't listen to others as if they're sources of information. And you can see this kind of on down the line. I'm not sure that all virtues have this sort of structure where we have a virtue that's flanked by two vices, but a lot of them seem to. I'm not sure that virtues like uh, honesty have uh, you know, an excess vice. I'm not quite sure about that. But at any rate, at any rate this sort of uh, vice virtue vice schema can be a kind of helpful way to uh, home in on uh, the virtue. Okay, so these intellectual virtues differ from each other, at least in part, because they concern different areas of activity, right? That's what distinguishes them from each other. But here's what they hold in common, uh, this motivational component for truth, knowledge, and understanding, right? That's the kind of positive motivational component. And then the negative one will be, you know, an aversion to kind of the intellectual bad things like falsehood and ignorance and so on. Okay, so that's a little bit about what these intellectual virtues are. Um, hopefully that, that gives us at least a working understanding. You know, we can always you know, go a bit further uh, in, the, in the discussion period. But let's talk for a few moments about why we might sensibly educate for these intellectual virtues. So one way to see this is to start by asking, well, what are some other things we already educate for, right? What we educate students to be prepared for a job, to gain knowledge, 
to gain certain skills. Sometimes these are skills that are directly job related. Other times these skills are kind of transferable skills, like skills in critical thinking and writing. Now, I want to suggest that all of these are valuable, uh, but that none of them are sufficient in themselves, uh, nor are they sufficient for a complete education if we sort of put them all together. Uh, so I, I got to thinking about this um, in part because I was reading some, uh, some work in uh, the philosophy uh, sector, um, the field called epistemology. This is the theory of knowledge. And there's been a, a group of philosophers called virtue epistemologists who have highlighted the importance of intellectual virtues uh, as part of kind of the, the cognitive life, right? The intellectual life. The other kind of key impetus that got me thinking about why we should educate for these virtues was that I was writing uh, a purpose statement for um, professor jobs, right? I was applying just out of grad school, trying to become a professor. And when you apply to be a professor, as many of you know, that they, they have you write these statements of teaching purpose. So I got to thinking about what I wanted for my students. And, and initially I thought, well, in addition to the ability to gain a job, I'd want them to know some things, right? There are certain things that an educated person just should know. And that seems right. And it's good so far as it goes. But I thought about it a little more and I thought, you know, I've, I've forgotten a lot of what I've learned in my classes. So I really hope that's not the whole of it. And I also noticed that, that someone might have a lot of knowledge, but not be able to connect the various bits of knowledge from one you know, area of inquiry to other areas. So it seems like we need more than just knowledge. So then I thought, well, maybe skills, right? Maybe skills would be an important thing to add, right? So skills in critical thinking, you, you might think of logical reasoning as a helpful tool for seeing connections between various bits of knowledge. So that seems like progress. Or you might think of kind of critical reasoning that we have to use to avoid being duped by fake news, right? That seems really important. Or you might think of the skill of being able to communicate clearly. So again, all really important and all part of the package. But then as I thought about it a little more, it became clear, even if we add skills to knowledge, that's not gonna be enough because we can use skills toward unwise ends or toward unworthy ends. So you might think of a political pundit sort of using their position and their communication skills to sort of spread fake news or propaganda or something like that, right? These are unwise and unworthy ends, right? What we care about in addition to those things is truth and knowledge as such. Um, once we start to see that, that it's worth caring about intellectual goods for their own sakes, it starts to raise questions about, well, what, what's it like to be a thinker who cares about truth and knowledge for their own sake? What does it look like to be you know, that kind of person? There's this kind of, okay, you might have knowledge and skills, but what about the personal element of this? And here it just, it started to dawn on me and I'm not the only one, right? And I didn't sort of make this up. I'm not the first one to think of it. Maybe, Part of what's going on here is our educational aims are um, kind of too narrow because we're not thinking about the character traits of an excellent thinker. Uh, there's this book by Andrew Del Bonco. He has taught for many years at Columbia University. And in this book, this is called College, What It Was, Is, and Should Be, he quotes this colleague of his who says, you know, you want the inside of your head to be an interesting place to live the rest of your life. This is what she says to her students. And then Del Banco starts to catalog some features of a mind that is an interesting place right, to live the rest of your life. And he starts to catalog some of these features and they start to look a lot like intellectual virtues. They start to look like curiosity and open-mindedness and humility and uh, the like of those. We might also kind of get a handle on why intellectual virtues are important for the educational process by thinking about what it is to be a lifelong learner. A, a lot of teachers say they want their students to become lifelong learners. I'm gonna bet that if we start to list the character traits of a lifelong learner, uh, we'll start to list things like curiosity and open-mindedness and thoroughness and autonomy, this willingness to sort of think for ourselves, right? These are intellectual virtues. So the language of intellectual virtues, at, at least for me, provided a helpful way to express 
some of the things that I might already have been inclined to express. Uh, one other thing to note here, and, and this comes uh, directly from the philosopher Jason Baer. In fact, he's got a terrific book called Deep in Thought uh, that anyone who's interested in this material really ought to pick up and read. Baer talks about how intellectual virtues education provides us with a way to keep education both rigorous and personal. Right? And, and you can imagine that these two would often come apart. You know, you've got these education programs that are very rigorous, right? That, emphasize things like high test scores and you know, high academic achievement according to kind of objective standards, right? And then on the other hand, you've got this kind of personal aspect to it, this kind of come alongside students aspect, uh, this aspect that focuses on students' personal qualities. And what Bear points out is that if we focus on educating for intellectual virtues, we, we then have a framework where we can have both of those things at once, right? So we have a framework that's rigorous and that it calls for genuine excellence. And so, you know, it allows me to say to that, that student of mine who's an A student, but who's really still not doing work to the best of their ability, hey, why don't you try to be even more thorough, right? Why don't you go even, even further with this? Why don't you try to be, you know, even more careful with the work or show more humility in this kind of, um, this kind of endeavor, right? So, so it allows for an uptick in rigor, but it also focuses on the personal characteristics of the student, right? What kind of person do you wanna be, right? What, what kind of character traits do you want to take on? So the, at this combination of rigor and kind of um, personal qualities is something that I find um, really pretty attractive. So those are some reasons for educating for intellectual virtues. Again, if, you, if you'd if you like more, I would really suggest uh, diving into to Bear's book here. But what about the how? How can we do this? Here, the, the first thing I'll say is that it, it's sort of early days for educating for intellectual virtues. Right? It's not like we have a whole bunch of rigorously tested methods that we're extremely confident will work. But it's also not like we're just sort of guessing. We, we have some some really uh, well-informed uh, guesses about what to try that have started to have some early returns. So those are the things that I'll be sharing with you. I'm sure many of you have your own things to add in here and I'd, I'd love to hear them. So, so the first two things I'll mention, we need to talk the talk and walk the walk. By talk the talk, I just mean we need to use this kind of language in the classroom, language about intellectual virtue in general, language relating to specific virtues like humility and autonomy, and open-mindedness and fairness and firmness and charity. We need to introduce students to this, this language so that then they're able to acquire the framework and, and see intellectual virtues as, as kind of an overarching um, framework for education, right? that they can use uh, to make sense of why we're doing what we're doing. I find that it's possible to introduce students to this kind of framework in something like 10 to 20 minutes, maybe a half an hour at the most. And then they've got kind of enough of the basics under their belts to move forward. And then the name of the game seems to me to, to be to try to reinforce the language throughout the, the rest of the course. So, you know, some things we can try, maybe explicitly linking each class assignment on the syllabus to at least one virtue, right? So what this, what this highlights is that teaching for intellectual virtues is more about how we teach than it is about what we teach. So I don't, I don't have the time to include a whole bunch of extra intellectual virtues related assignments to my classes. I just have too much content for that. But what I can do is kind of add an intellectual virtues element to each of my assignments. And this is a way to reinforce the framework without adding a bunch of extra time to, to class, you know, lecture or discussion or, um, you know, or, or homework. I also am doing my best to use virtue language in feedback on assignments. This is uh, another tip I, I got actually from, from Bear. So, you know, instead of just writing things like good job or, you know, this is a fine paper, I'm doing my best to say more things like, you've shown a lot of thoroughness here, or 
this is a good instance of humility on your part. Or maybe in other cases, you know, instead of, oh, this is wrong, uh, you know, a little more carefulness might have prevented this mistake or something like that. But using, using virtue language and the feedback on the assignments is another way to enforce the, the language and help students see their education in terms of these virtues, at least in part. About the only thing that, that I do that requires a bunch of extra time, well, not a bunch of extra time, but significant extra time beyond, which, uh, beyond what I would normally invest in my, in my content is just to provide some brief self-assessment exercises or, or kind of questionnaires that are designed to give students at least uh, you know, a, a rough idea what some of their strengths and weaknesses might be. And so they can have a sense of which virtues they might wanna select as targets for, for growth, right? So maybe you know, they, they figure out that they struggle with autonomy, right? Maybe they're not thinking for themselves enough. Maybe they're relying too much on others or maybe they're relying on themselves too much and they need to give more deference to what others say. But these, these kinds of self-assessment exercises uh, provide a, a means of self-reflection so that students can start thinking about how they might want to grow. So that's a bit about talking the talk. Another thing we need to do is walk the walk, by which I just mean we need to model these intellectual virtues in the classroom. So we can do this by behaving in intellectually virtuous ways. We can do this by demonstrating our values, right? By just showing that we care about knowledge in its own right. Sometimes that's just a matter of, of talking the talk, right? Saying, look, I really care about this. Um, and we can cultivate, you know, uh, a, a desire for understanding by showing that we have that sort of desire, right? Let's dig into this stuff together. Let's see if we can dig deeper here rather than, than stay on the surface. So, I mean, how does this look concretely? Some things we can try. I'm, I'm sure you have your own ideas. Um, I've, I've found that students respond pretty well when they hear their professor say, I don't know, or in response to a reading, hey, this one was difficult for me too. I had to read this, you know, four times last night in order to have a sense of what the author's up to. When students hear those kinds of things, um, it encourages them that it's okay to have limitations, right? That they don't have to get it all for themselves right away. So that's one way we can try to model uh, these, these virtues, especially humility. Um, or, you know, when we find ourselves in the midst of a difficult passage, we can say things like, let's press on through this passage. This is hard. Uh, I know it's difficult for you. It's difficult for me too. Let's see if we can keep moving. Uh, curiosity. Students ask wonderful questions in class. Sometimes they ask the same questions that I have, in, in which case it's, I think, fair to say, hey, I've been wondering about that. That's a great question. Let's, let's think about that further. Uh, another thing to do, an even better thing to do, is something that I saw uh, the philosopher Christian Miller do at a conference. He was giving a talk and Someone in the audience asked a question and it was a tough question. And he just stood there for a minute and he said, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question, but that's a really interesting question. And then he took the, took the time actually to write it down and then sort of wandered aloud about the question for a few moments. And in that moment, I thought he showed not only great humility, but also a great deal of curiosity, right? Just being attuned to the question that someone else was interested in and, and finding that question interesting himself. Uh, what about the virtue of carefulness? What's something we can, can do there? Uh, one thing that, that can be uh, pretty simple to do is to take a, a chunk of prose that contains a, an argument, you know, a set of reasons that are given in favor of a conclusion and just write the argument in step-by-step -step form on the board. Hopefully you've got a real chalkboard instead of just a whiteboard for doing this. That'll make it seem more official and intellectually serious. But, but, but this can let students see how the argument is supposed to go and then, and then help them move from kind of a vague sense of, oh, I don't like this, or I, don't, I think something's off here to a sense of, oh, now I see maybe exactly where the problem might be or where the pressure point is for the discussion. So those are some ways we can try to walk the walk. Uh, one caution here, I, I once uh, heard a, a good preacher say, it's important not to be the hero in your own sermon. And I think that's true when it comes to our own teaching lessons too. We, we shouldn't make ourselves the heroes of our own lessons, right? So 
you know, we've got to be really careful not to hold ourselves up as paragons of intellectual virtue. If we can just hold ourselves up as people who are trying to pursue these virtues, I think that's that's probably good enough. It's okay, I think, sometimes to share that we're, we're grateful to have made some progress or something like that. But important, I think, that students see that we're really doing the same kind of thing that they're doing, namely, you know, trying to make progress in our pursuit of these virtues, right? We're, we're not finished product. A third thing we can do, maybe this fits under the walk, the, uh, talk the talk heading, but, uh, but even more uh, sort of personal way to do this is to tell stories, right? To tell narratives of intellectual virtues in action, or maybe sometimes intellectual vices in action. So uh, one story that, that will be um, sort of dear to philosophers hearts is the story of Gottlob Frege and uh, the way Bertrand Russell um, really <laughs> in some ways almost ruined Frege's career by providing this, um, this well-known objection to Frege's mathematical framework. So the, the background of this is Frege was doing some, some groundbreaking work at the foundations of mathematics. He had just published a volume uh, on this and was about to publish a second when a young upstart philosopher and mathematician, mathematician Bertrand Russell realized that there was a crippling problem in uh, one of Frege's assumptions. Frege ended up not only admitting that the problem was real, but publishing the problem as an appendix to his book, right? Sort of for, the, for all the world to see this problem. And so here's what Russell says as he reports on sort of how he felt observing this. He says, as I think of acts of integrity and grace, I realize that there is nothing in my knowledge to compare with Frege's dedication to the truth. His entire life's work was on the verge of completion. Much of his work had been ignored to the benefit of men infinitely less capable. His second volume was about to be published and upon finding that his fundamental assumption was an error, he responded with intellectual pleasure, clearly submerging any feelings of personal disappointment. It was almost superhuman and a telling indication of that which men are capable if their dedication to creative work and knowledge, uh, right, if that's what's central, instead of cruder efforts to dominate and be known. Um, I find that inspiring. Here's, here's another story that I just love. Uh, if you are in the medical field, you will have heard of Helen Tausig. So Tausig was the founder of pediatric cardiology. She ended up developing a surgery called the Blaylock Tausig surgery, which was a surgery that helped uh, save the lives of countless uh, infants who were so-called blue babies, right? They had this blue complexion that was a symptom of a deadly heart defect. Uh, Tausig went on to become the first female president of the American Heart Association. She published hundreds of papers. She, uh, in 1964, received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, right? So a, a great deal of accomplishment, right? As much as you can really accomplish in, in medicine, really. But if you'd known her as a child, you would never have predicted this. So, uh, and I'll just sort of tick through a list of obstacles that Tausig had to encounter, right? So as an infant, she contracted tuberculosis and this held her back in her education, right? For a couple of years, she was only able to attend school half time. Her mother died when she was just 11. She battled learning disabilities that made it hard for her to read and to recognize numbers and these difficulties were severe enough that they led her father to wonder privately whether Helen would even finish grammar school. Uh, despite this, he, he tutored her and was determined to, to help her achieve all she could achieve. And eventually she was able to go to college. She went to Radcliffe College and then eventually to, to Berkeley. Uh, but because she continued to struggle, right, because reading was slow for her, she struggled with self-doubt. She eventually discovered, uh, at least this is her self-diagnosis, that these reading troubles and these troubles keeping numbers uh, sort of straight were dyslexia. But despite all this, she persevered and her work was excellent, right? It kept sort of improving because she was just trying a, a great deal harder than everybody else was. Then it came time to pick a profession and she chose medical school. She wanted to go into the medical school uh, so that she could become a doctor. But it turned out at that time that women weren't allowed into medical schools, at least not most of them. So she's rejected at the Harvard Medical School. 
decides to try to apply instead to the Harvard School of Public Health, which did admit women, only to find out that women who earned a degree, uh, sorry, women who completed the program were not able to even earn a degree, right? They could just go through the program and, and get really no official credential for it. She decided that's not for me. Eventually she goes to Johns Hopkins and she enters this field, pediatric cardiology, right? So infant heart care, which was a brand new field at the time. And it's a field of which many people were skeptical, right? A lot of people thought this was a dead end field. So as, as she puts it, she galloped into these, this field because she was right, excited to do it and found that there's no data. <laughs> there's no data to work with in this field. So she had to compile virtually all the data available for herself. And within 10 years, she had done a great deal of work on this only to find that she was losing her hearing. Now think about this, you're an infinite heart doctor, right? Your main instrument is your stethoscope and you lose your hearing. She provides a workaround. She adds an amplifier to her telescope uh, and then eventually learns to, to feel for the pulse and to use electrocardiogram machines to, to feel for, uh, to, to get an additional data point, right? Uh, finally, she ends up developing this surgery, right? But, but the, the point is we've got a life of someone who's a tremendous success in medicine, who encountered obstacles to her intellectual success and her, and her career as a doctor at almost every turn. Right? Uh, I don't know about you, but I just, find stories like that to be a, just a real shot in the arm. Right? It, it, it makes me think, oh, well, right, if she can do that, maybe I can get through the, the small obstacles that, that I face. But telling stories about what these intellectual virtues look like in action is, I think, a way to help students become inspired to, to pursue them. If you want more on Helen Tausig and people, uh, people like her in the medical field, see Rachel Swaby's terrific book, Headstrong. This is a a compilation of, of vignettes about women who've made important contributions in the sciences. I'm just an inspiring work. The uh, last thing I'll suggest is just holding practice, by which I mean providing students with practice in activities that are relevant to intellectual virtues. So here we can take the advice that Aristotle has related to moral virtues. He says, we are what we repeatedly do, right? So if we wanna become courageous, we should perform courageous acts. If we wanna become just, we should perform just acts and so on. That's an important part of moral formation. And I think it can be an important part of intellectual formation. So, so here are just some possible exercises that we might consider for our students. And there, there are dozens of these, there's no official list. And I think th this is an area where collaboration and creativity can really can really help us. But if we're thinking of just a few virtues and classroom activities that might be conducive towards some of those, here are some thoughts. So the virtues of attentiveness and autonomy, right? So this can really help us to, um, these are the virtues that help us to pay attention to say what we're reading and to take ownership of our own learning, right? So we need to become attentive and careful readers and not just readers who are sort of soaking things in from the books that we read or from what other, uh, other things we read, but also who think about them, right? And who take, take a kind of responsibility for what we gleaned from those books. So one thing we can do is ask students to keep uh, what's, what used to be called a commonplace book, a book of notes on the readings that we assign for classes. Often these notes can be assigned in response to specific questions about a reading, readings that are arranged in such a way that if students can answer all the questions in, the, in a reading guide that, that they'll have understood the reading, but also questions that prompt further reflection. Uh, students who take such notes, uh, at least they've reported to me, have, have found themselves to be deeper readers at the end of the term than they were at the beginning. And, and some of them actually continue this practice. Uh, what about courage or carefulness, uh, perseverance? There we can do an activity, uh, I just call it revise and resubmit. So just have students submit drafts for at least some papers in the class in two drafts. Uh, this works particularly well for longer term papers. Maybe it's, it's more appropriate for majors level courses, upper division courses, 
than for lower level courses, although it might work well there too. So uh, the way this works, and I've, I've got a colleague who's been doing this for years and, and has found it uh, to, to help him. I, I started to adopt it for myself. Students submit a, a real draft of a paper, not a, a rough draft, but a real attempt to get things right. They do this with maybe a month or five weeks left in the term. And then very quickly, a professor can provide detailed feedback, both on the style and substance of the paper. And then students get a chance to revise in light of that feedback. Um, we've also recently paired students up with a partner with whom they swap papers and they give each other feedback. Uh, this can foster uh, courage. It can also foster honesty as they give feedback uh, to their peers, uh, courage as they, as they receive it. Uh, but this is a way to, again, provide some practice in some of these virtues. Uh, for open-mindedness, we might have students identify their view and then assign them to argue for the opposite view. Not for the sake of, you know, converting them to that opposite view, but for the sake of seeing whatever merits the view has and being able to appreciate them. Uh, and notice that won't end up resulting in students say, in, you know, endorsing truly heinous, horrible views because such views don't really have merits, right? So open-mindedness only requires us to take seriously the merits of um, other views. If those views end up not having merits, then we don't have to take them seriously. Of course, that's something we can only figure out after having carefully looked at the arguments in, in favor of, of the view, right? So uh, we need some open-mindedness on the front end uh, before we could dismiss a, a, a terrible view. Uh, the last thing that might be worth trying is the routine called the CSQ routine. This comes from Harvard uh, theorist, uh, Ron Richhart. He's in the School of Education at Harvard. And he's got this routine called claim support question. And there the thought is, okay, we, we find the main claim that an author or maybe classmate or professor has made and then identify the support that's been given on behalf of that claim. Philosophers call this, you know, identify the conclusion, and then identify the, the premises. But just, you know, to keep it simpler, identify the claim, identify the support, and then we can begin to ask questions about whether that support is strong support or not. This is a sort of workaround, uh, you know, for those of us who, who wish everybody would take, you know, two or three logic classes during their time at a university. Now, this is a workaround that can keep us doing the kinds of things that we would do in a logic class without having to introduce as much sort of technical apparatus. So this can provide, I think, a good start in the direction of, of logical reasoning. Um, you can see some more resources for educating for intellectual virtue down here in the list. Uh, again, I mentioned Bear's book. He's got an ebook called Cultivating Good Minds. This is available for free at intellectualvirtues.org. At least I think it's still free. This is a, a more or less comprehensive guide toward educating for intellectual virtues. Um, it was written as I understand it um, in part for K through 12 teachers, but a lot of it is applicable at the, the collegiate level as well. Uh, you should also see Ron Richhart's book, Intellectual Character, What It Is, Why It Matters, and How to Get It. Richhart speaks more in terms of what he calls thinking dispositions than in terms of uh, intellectual virtues explicitly, uh, but, but highly relevant. And then lastly, Rachel Swaby's book, Headstrong, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. I'm afraid it went on a little longer than I was supposed to, but I hope we still have plenty of time for some good discussion. I think we have time. Thank you, Nate, for that, for that presentation. I appreciate it. I know that there are some folks here who are not able to be on camera or, or speak out. Um, you're welcome to drop a question in the chat if you would like, and I'll, I'll watch the chat and look for, look for questions there. I'm gonna go ahead and start. I, I was writing up questions as, as you were talking on, on a number of really interesting things. And I think maybe one, one question that I just would like to start with, um, if you don't mind, is to think a little bit, you know, you distinguish your focus here on educating for intellectual virtues rather than moral virtues or civic virtues or something like that. And you often talked about sort of the goods that these intellectual virtues target. So goods of knowledge, truth, understanding, or avoiding, um, the opposite, so error, ignorance, falsehood, those sorts of things. Um, and then a little bit later on when you were reading the Russell quote, there's this line in there that talks about um, 
sort of a, a valuing knowledge for its own sake and not for the ability to dominate or to be known, right? right? And that suggests different types, a different type of good, even then, like, so it's the, the, the ability to sort of control other people's minds or control the direction of thought or control the direction of inquiry or to be known as the one who knows, right? Or to be known as the one who is um, sort of knowledgeable or something like that. So I'd just like to invite you, if you don't mind, to, to sort of talk a little bit more about the intellectual goods maybe some distinctions that like, how, what's the difference between knowledge and understanding, um, those sorts of things. And then think about those in contrast to the other types of goods, like these social things about domination or about being known. Right, yeah. Well, I mean, as far as the intellectual goods go, I, I don't have anything sort of, you know, fancy to say. I mean, we, we, we do, or at least should value truth, which, you know, as I'm thinking of it means something like, uh, you know, matching reality, or at any rate, if, you know, if you say something's the case, what you say is true, you know, only if that thing's the case, and because that thing's the, the case. So some people talk about correspondence with reality. That's that's one way to understand this. Uh, but notice that you could you could end up with true beliefs just sort of by lucking into them, right? Maybe maybe if you made a lucky guess and talked yourself into that guess as something that was really right, you, you could end up getting it right, but that's not really what we want, or at least we don't want to just have that. We, we want to believe things in such a way that we reliably get to the truth, or that we have good reasons to get, uh, good reasons for what we truly believe. And so, you know, some philosophers talk about having a, a justification for our beliefs, others just talk about, in ter you know, in terms of coming to the belief in, in the right way. But there, the I mean, the deep insight is that if we're getting it right by luck, that's not intellectually, you know, satisfying. We, we want to get it right, but get it right in the right way, you know. So, so knowledge differs from mere uh, true belief. And then there's understanding, which uh, there's a big literature on this that, that I, I won't do justice to now, but you might think of understanding as like, you know, one variety is knowing the causes of things, right? So that's a kind of, maybe a kind of a species of knowledge, but it's a, a sort of higher kind of knowledge, right? Where we not just understand or, or know that things are the case, but have a sense of why they're the case. Or we might think of understanding as an ability to see connections between things, right? These are all intellectual uh, goods. And then, you know, you mentioned these other goods, right? So that, you know, willingness not to dominate others. That, that sounds a lot like the kind of the, the moral kind of humility. Uh, or, or we talk about, you know, civic virtues uh, or, or at least interpersonal virtues like empathy. Um, and, I, you know, it's, it's not always quite clear to me how to distinguish you know, intellectual virtues from moral virtues, from civic virtues. There's a lot of overlap here. I think in theory, right, if we wanted to, to draw some lines, we could say that intellectual virtues always aim at intellectual goods, but moral moral virtues don't have to, right? But moral virtues are gonna aim at things like, you know, justice and the allevi alleviation of suffering and so on. Um, I think Alan Wilson has a really nice paper on this distinction. Uh, but in but in practice, I think we find that there's a lot of overlap. I mean, when I when I think of a lot of my failures to love others well, maybe to love my family well, there are there are intellectual errors at the back of those, right? Failures of attentiveness or you know, failures of charity, right? You know, my daughter asks for an extra scoop of ice cream and I make some unfair or uncharitable assumption about her, but you know, before I say no, you know, you've you had too much already. And she'd be like, well, no, I didn't actually have any today. Well, maybe I should have gone a little more slowly there. I'm sure you can think of all kinds of, you know, cases, but it, it does seem like our ability to love others well is going to depend at least in part on our ability to think well about claims related to that person or to, to those others. Uh, uh, Philip Dow has a really nice line on this. He says, you know, try, try loving your neighbor while practicing intellectual carelessness. Uh, it just can't be, it just can't be done. 
So I, I really do think there's there's significant overlap in practice here. That's interesting. I, want, I just want to follow up briefly on that. Like the, I was thinking about this this the notion of dominating dominating and being known, right? And these there's there are I think there are clear intellectual cases. Like so, suppose you think about a person who wants to be the thought leader, right? Wants to be at the cutting edge and leading the conversations. And you might even think about, um, you know, uh, think about a, um, a, an academic who wants to, to develop a lab and, ha and create um, groupies or create um, from, from the person that he's training or she's training a bunch of people who will just willingly follow the agenda that, that they're setting. So you're sort of thinking of this sort of leading the thought, being the thought leader, being the one who's at front and who's controlling the flow of thought. There's a sort of intellectual component. There's a moral component to that too, of course. But I think um, if you think about that in terms of, of cultivating intellectual humility as a way of not having to dominate the conversation, right? Not having to be the leader. And this might be a sort of an opposed to, it might, it might even work with intellectual autonomy, right? Not not just having to, to, to force everyone into like not being willing to allow others to speak to to matters that are important as well. And then the other point about being known strikes me again, like I don't just want knowledge or understanding. I want others to know that I have knowledge and understanding, right? <laughs> right. Um, right. And that strikes me as a, as a sign of, of an intellectual flaw, intellectual character flaw, as, as a, a sort of intellectual pride that sneaks in where I might be willing to make subservient the, the, the knowledge for knowledge sake or understanding for understanding sake subservient to this more important goal of mine, which is to have the glory, right? right. And, and I think that, that that's an, another interesting element component to that. Yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. I, I, we academics do this all the time when we, when we name drop or when we, when we nod along in the midst of a conversation in which we, we don't really understand what's going on, but we nod along. We want others to think that we're with it, <laughs> but we don't say, oh, you know what? I could, I could really use a brush up on what that thinker says, right? Or, or I, I haven't heard of that thinker. Uh, there's, oh, I'll show you something on this. There's this great book, I Don't Know, by Leah Hager Cohen. Sorry if that's not coming through right. Okay. Leah Hager Cohen, I Don't Know. She talks about a friend of hers, and she calls her Mary, who, when when faced with a conversation like this in which lots of people are dropping names she hasn't heard of or talking about something she hasn't read she just says i don't know that person i haven't read that book uh, th that's a kind of honesty and humility that i think you know we we all admire um, and the interesting thing is that le that actually lends itself to more knowledge right because by asking for explanations mary's able to get more knowledge than she would have gotten had she just nodded along. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, let me open the floor to anyone else who'd like to ask a question. You can drop it in the chat or you can raise it. Looks like there's one in the chat. Uh, Luke says, this has been super interesting. I'm curious how you would approach working with a student who quote, just wants to know the answer or how to do something and is impatient with discussing the theory behind it or the nuances of the issue. Yeah, that's a good question. And this it, was this a student who asked this? No, this is, this is one of the other philosophers on campus. Okay, all right. If it was a student, I was going to put the question back on the student and see if they could tell me how I should do it right. <laughs> but no, I, I think this is an area where, uh, where, where patience has to come in and then gently, gently pushing the student to see, you know, I can understand why you want the answer or why you just want to know how to do it. But if I leave you out on your own for just a little longer, you're going to understand this in a way that you could never understand it by my just telling you, right? You'll you'll come to understand something that you could have only gotten by testimony from me. Um, I actually had a a professor in graduate school who did this for me. I was wanting we so we have in graduate school these intimidating oral examinations. You have to you know basically memorize a whole bunch of articles and then and then you get asked questions about them and I was kind of pressing my advisor for for more face-to-face -face time to talk about these articles and this professor just said you kind of need to stand on your own two feet here and I'm really glad that the professor you know did that 
So, and, and the professor did that not out of laziness, but for my good, right? This enabled me to learn things with a depth I could never have learned them if the professor had caved to my, you know, my requests. Yeah, that's interesting. We have another quote in the chat from Dr. Brightman. Uh, she writes, I think that part of being a little less ignorant than other people comes with the responsibility of help helping others be less ignorant also, correct? That sounds right to me. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the chapters of your book that I think where this becomes most clear are the chapters where you talk about intellectual virtues that are sort of other directed. I wonder if you might speak a little bit about I mean, maybe the chapter on fair mindedness and charity is probably is probably the most relevant in this context. Yeah. So let's see. Well, I mean, one thing that we might point out here is that these intellectual virtues aren't just about my getting knowledge or your getting knowledge, but they're also about our, our keeping the knowledge we have and then sharing it. Right. It, it would be uh, it would be a real loss if it just sort of died with us. Right. Um, as as my former provost, Carol Simon, pointed out, you know, knowledge is the kind of gift such that you can share it without having having any less of it yourself. Right. Whereas other goods, we give them to others and we have less of them. Knowledge isn't like that. Right. It, it only multiplies the more we the more we give it away. So that that focus of intellectual virtue on, on sharing knowledge is important um, and some particular virtues where, the, where this can be relevant. So I, I think of charity as as an important one, sort of doing unto others as we would have done to us in intellectual matters. And and there, I mean, a, I think a great example. So I've, I've got a, a friend who worked with an, an advisor whose whose work my friend was criticizing. So my, my friend is <laughs> writing a dissertation and is attacking his advisor's view. And this advisor spends just hour after hour helping my friends make his arguments better so that he can refute the professor. So I mean, that's just remarkable to me. You, you would know the, the name of this professor if I, if I said it, but the person so humble probably wouldn't want me to say. So that's a gift, right? giving that good to this person, helping them to strengthen their view. That's a way of, of sharing knowledge that, um, you know, obviously goes beyond just this professor having the knowledge, uh, but, but helping this, this student to, to get it. Yeah. That's great. Other questions? Those are great questions. Um, I guess we have time for one more. I think maybe I'll, I'll ask the last question and, um, this was this occurred to me as I was as I've been thinking about your book and thinking about and as I'm thinking about it, I'm going to put the link in the chat for anybody who's interested. Um, uh, as I've been teaching this book and thinking about it and, and thinking it through with my students, I've I, I've actually put this question to my students a couple times, so I'm going to put it to you. Um, so, can we develop these virtues without explicit instruction about these virtues? So I think that's an easy question, um, easier question maybe. Um, and but there's a follow-up, and that is if the answer is yes, that we can develop these without explicit instruction. What is the value added from having explicit instruction about these traits? Okay. So can we develop these traits without explicit instruction? <sighs> So could you become interested? They're always asking questions about what's possible, right? So I'm thinking <laughs> of some scenario. So I, I mean, I'm going to suggest that it's that's going to be a relatively rare case. It might depend on what we count as instruction, right? Is reading a narrative, does that count as instruction? Um, but what I suggest is that we can get pretty far with fairly minimal instruction. Um, what really matters, I think, is practice and emulation and looking at exemplars. But I don't think you know, the, the direct instruction is, is without value because it, the, the more direct instruction we have, the kind of the more we know what to look for in terms of what are the specific motivations I should be seeking that are relevant to this specific virtue, humility, or this specific virtue, autonomy. The, the, the additional instruction can provide a, a degree of precision 
that we might not get otherwise. And I think that can be helpful as we select our goals and, and the means toward those goals. But, you know, I think initially, right, to get started, the, the startup cost isn't that high in terms of, you know, direct instruction. But, I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to say that it's um, the direct instruction is somehow unimportant or something, something like that. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Nate. I really appreciate the talk that you gave here and appreciate for your, your time with us today, both in the earlier lecture and this lecture as well. And thank you to everyone who was able to join us. I will, I'm, I'm glad that I was able to record this as well to share with those folks who, who were not able to, to log on tonight. So thank you so much for your time and for your engagement with us. Um, and, and that brings tonight's discussion to a conclusion. Thanks, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you all so much for for logging on. I know that you're all busy and it's dinner hour, so I, I was just delighted that you were able to join us. And thank you, Aaron, for setting this up. This was really a lot of fun. <laughs>